one, zero. Tess, we're now in <laughs> California. How are you doing? I'm doing awesome, Rob. How are you? Oh, I, I went for an hour-long run just now this morning um, in England with the dog. And because I'm like on a legitimate uh, weaning prescription with the Valium now, um, went to the pharmacy at eight. But obviously, because of the pandemic, everything's been thrown through a loop. So it's open at half eight. So I'm stood outside there, a bit twitchy. But then I get back and, and speak to you, and it's, it, and it's and it's all good. So I'm in the countryside <laughs> of England. Can you explain first of all where you, where you are and how lockdown's expecting you? Because you're pretty remote, aren't you? Yes, I'm in uh, Northern California, and uh, the Northern California is pretty different to the South. The South is very much a city. Northern California is more like little towns in right. the middle of nature. So the lockdown hasn't been as intense here because everybody's living sort of in the forest anyway. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, noticing the biggest difference is obviously in like no social gatherings, but having to wear a mask, it's like forced here to wear one in, if you go inside any sort of closed building. In the state of California? Yeah. Wow. And so how's that affected you psychologically since the announcement, since you found out about all this? Um, I mean, it's been okay, like, because I'm someone that's been working um on farms and things like that so I've kind of been uh used to isolation like being on mountains and forests and stuff and my I've got a little van which I travel in and I've got solar panels on the roof so it's quite like I'm quite used to living this kind of life are you off the grid pretty much I'm pretty off grid yeah but I guess the only thing I do miss is more social interactions I go to ecstatic dance quite often, so it's affected me in that sense. Um, but it has yeah. given me the opportunity to play more guitar and to FaceTime my friends that I haven't spoken to in so many years. Like I spoke to friends that I haven't spoken to in like 10 years. And so that's been really nice. And just an opportunity to be still, self-reflection, be in nature, not have any social obligations. It's also been pretty good, like just knowing that I'm sort of free from anything and and yeah, just using so, time. so you've missed you've missed the socialising, but not the um, not the sort of the uh, relentless obligations that come with it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I don't have any so, FOMO, so, no fear of missing out because there's nothing going on. <laughs> that's exactly what my friend said the other day. Jack Jones, I interviewed him. He he, um, he turned down an offer from MIT uh, in nuclear engineering. He turned it down at 26 to pursue psychological well-being um yeah, and he's awesome he's so him. he sounds like a cool dude man Boots i interviewed him yeah i'm offended you haven't watched it yet very offended um <laughs> in fact, trying to limit my screen time here rob <laughs> <laughs> okay two things to say we're going to talk about addiction today and tess yeah. has very kindly agreed to sort of open up about that and um the second thing is when I upload things to YouTube from Skype. So imagine a picture frame that's like 12 by 6. You think that's what you're uploading, but then you end up with a picture frame that's 10 by 4. And so often my head ends up sort of, it probably is already doing it when it's on YouTube. It'll end up at the side. or It wasn't planned like that. It, it was, it's, Skype, it's Skype messing with me. I've been told to upgrade to Zoom by, um, by Tess. So Tess, what were you addicted to? <laughs> uh, the one that I was the most addicted to was weed. Uh, right. marijuana smoked it almost every day for about 10 years maybe even 12 mm-hmm. years uh, so that was, um, and then I was a very much of a big social drinker so every weekend or every time I'd sort of go out to like a bar or a club or a gig any sort of social interaction I'd drink quite a lot of alcohol every time and pretty much every time uh Maybe, like, if I had work the next day, I wouldn't drink as much, but I would still have a little bit. But if it was a weekend, I'd pretty much get paralytically drunk so that I didn't even remember my night the next day. Like, yeah, I, um, I remember um, you coming back from the park at, like, 7 a.m. one one day because two <laughs> of your friends and you, had, male friends, had gone and to a swing, and you came back just covered in 
<clears throat> look like you've been fighting Mike Tyson. Maybe that was some sort of was that a bit of a wake up call or or not? Well, I, what I, I mean, I don't know which night you're talking about, but what do you mean? I was what covered in what? If you, bruises, because you fell uh, off a swing. It literally doing a three sixty uh, on a swing. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that actually. Yeah, that was that was common. I'd always wake up with bruises all over my body and not know where they came from. I was very wild. I'd get really wild and I'd want to like jump off things and like do yeah. jackass moments, you know. Mm. Yeah. What was okay? Apart from the swing, what was the most reckless thing? What was the most reckless thing that you did? Um, I did silly things like. <laughs> uh, I do silly things like uh, when I was inside a bar. If the, as soon as the guy would be pouring a shot, turn turns around, I'd steal the bottle and I'd go around pouring in everyone's mouth in the club. Um, I once jumped up on a bar counter and flashed my boobs. <laughs> to the barman or to the other to the crowd to the crowd of course yeah i guess you might as well do it properly um, <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean I wasn't, I wasn't violent i was just very wild and i would do things that were rather shameful i guess that i wasn't very proud of um i didn't have okay. any much, much morals as well but I don't know, you, uh, you've always been a very like warm-hearted person it's not like you get drunk and transform into some into some sociopath or like yeah. malevolent person yeah. i do know people like that i won't yeah. name them hang yeah. them. <laughs> i'll put them in yeah. the top um, yeah. right, um how long I what else were you addicted to drugs as well i did uh, a lot of mdma in my late 20s um mm -hmm. and what's mdma people what is it yeah uh, it's like a white powder that uh, gives you a sort of euphoric, ecstatic feeling. Um, it's a very loved up drug. So you feel a lot of love and compassion for everyone around you. And you just want to touch everyone and hug everyone. It's actually a really nice drug. But the come down is really yeah. bad because your serotonin is magnified or amplified. Then it, you just come crashing afterwards and it can be very depressing and uh, yeah, for like three or four days, I'd be hungover and I'd feel like right. absolute death. A lot of vomiting with alcohol and MDMA the next day, and just wasn't very pretty at all. <laughs> yes, I, I think it's neurotoxic MDMA, and um, <clears throat> now would actually be the worst time ever because, like you were saying, so I've heard from Stephen Fry on QI, you'd <laughs> take it and you get an overwhelming urge to be empathic and, and to hug people and, and to and to touch people, and to, and if if the rule was Stay two meters away from me, please. Um, and you're on your own for the come down. I wouldn't enjoy that at all right now. Yeah, for sure. But I do think if it's used in a medicinal way, I've heard that MDMA mm. can be quite uh, healing in a sense of uh, helping married couples or helping people with depression. But I think it, it's the way it's done. I think everything is the way it's done. If it's done as a form of escapism or if it's done as a form of to enhance your life or to better your life, then I think it's it's completely different. It's all the intention behind it, really. Yes, they. I believe MDMA was like sort of introduced to the because um, it didn't come out as a rave drug. It came out as quite a niche uh, research drug. Yeah. And I believe one of the first things it was used on was marriage counselling. Yeah. But I, you can see why. You know. Oh, yeah, I guess for it sure. works for. A, it works for a night, unlike a penis on a on a wedding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of my friends, she's been married to the same guy for, I don't know, 20 or 30 years, and she says that saved their marriage, is just, you know, Seamless. once a year taking MDMA together and just, like, sparking the, sparking the, igniting the fire, you know? Yeah. Do you find that you, from personal experience, by far the closest friends I've got of the opposite sex are ones that I haven't slept with? Do you find that? Do you find the same? <laughs> Say that again. Oh come on! Um, <laughs> do you find that the closest the closest friends you've got of the opposite sex are ones you haven't slept with that, that have lasted over the years? Oh yeah, of course, of course. I mean, definitely. I don't tend to sleep with my friends, to be honest with you. Like, if if it was a friend right. that I tend to sleep sleep with, then we'd land up being probably in a relationship. And then you'd go to hate them. <laughs> no, I don't actually hate them. I love all my ex-boyfriends and I want to be friends with them and they all don't speak to me anymore. 
I, th I think pain is the reason for that. I think I think they're not as full of warmth and sort of psychologically free as you and free of the past as you and, and men don't get as many offers in the opposite sex. It's harder to re to, to, re to rediscover your self-esteem and, and they will envy your happiness and they'll feel pain and therefore bitterness and then take it out on you. Yeah, I, I mean, definitely, even though a lot of them have moved on and they all have new girlfriends and um, they still, I guess, I, re I represent to them a moment of their life where they got rejected or... Yeah, and I represent pain to them and they don't want to revisit those memories and so they'd rather just like move on and whereas I'm like yes. they were my best friends as well as my lovers and I still want to be friends with them and I guess yeah, it's just the art of forgiveness and moving on and being completely self fulfilled and happy that I'm able to do that. Yeah, I um I believe it coming from you, knowing knowing what you've been up to the last <laughs> the last ten years. <laughs> so how long, okay, so weed, MDMA, what else? Um, ecstasy a little bit when I was younger, and then, yeah, that was pretty much it. I mean, I dabbled a little bit with cocaine and ketamine, but I didn't really like it. Um, but they're not really uh, drugs, I don't think. No, no, I was more, yeah, MDMA, weed, and alcohol. Those are the three ones that I was the most, had the most fun with. <laughs> Yes, they were they were very good, and then the most the most pain with. How would how would you how would you define addiction? Also, I don't know if you if you would if you would say mush magic mushrooms if you would count that as a drug, because that is something that I had did quite a lot as well. You do get mushroom ma magic mushroom cults that take just um, unwise amounts and um, wander around in robes, um, just doing that all day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I guess it could be addictive in that sense. But if you have a good psychedelic dose, so I've heard, um, you don't actually want one for another month or two. Yeah, well, that's the thing. It wasn't something that I was doing on a continuous basis. It would be like a novelty thing for me. But it is something that I've been doing from the age of 16 till now. But it will be like a couple times a year. And I, yeah, I believe okay. it's a very medicinal thing to do, to be honest. Well, could you give us any more? How do you think psychedelics are helpful? And can you talk about different psychedelics? Yes, I've done acid a few times as well. But I feel like with acid, you have to be so careful about the dosage. Uh, because the first time I ever took, took it, I took half a tab. And mm -hmm. I was tripping for like 16 hours. And mm -hmm. I wasn't aware that it was going to last that long. And I was at a festival. So the environment wasn't very good. And I started right. to think that I was losing my mind. It was probably the most vulnerable I've ever been. And I thought I was going to be like that forever. And I just wanted to die. I was, it was really tough. I actually, to, to be so vulnerable, you actually think you're losing your mind was a space that I'd never, ever wanted to be in. And it actually was really good because it helped me have a massive respect for psychedelics. And to, yes, to, yeah, to just, yeah. So after that, I only ever microdosed um, acid from now on. Yeah, but you've gone proper rainforest on all this, haven't you? What's Can you describe your experiences in the rainforest? Yeah, I mean, when I'm in the rainforest, I work more with mushrooms. I think acid's more been like a microdose thing that I'll do at a festival. Um, but when it comes to magic mushrooms, I do it in the forest. I do it in a ceremonial way where I connect with the spirit of the magic mushroom because I believe that all plants have spirits to them, tobacco okay. even mushrooms or, or ayahuasca, all those things, they have a spirit, a being behind the, the, the plant. And if you connect with the being and you actually show gratitude and respect and you set an intention, I found the experience to be so much more fulfilling and so much more pleasant. Um, yeah, I've had one bad experience with mushrooms when I was really, really drunk. I took it and I became really self-paranoid and and I just like thought everyone was conspiring against me. And that's only ever happened once. And that was because of the way that I had taken it. So I think it's really important how you do it. You, you truly learn in a psychedelic experience how, how, hot, how much of a hostage you are to your environment. Even yeah. just, um, even just a, a, the wrong book on a shelf, you catch a glimpse of a skull, like a scary skull. Which sound, yeah. might sound silly to people who haven't taken psychedelics, but people who have will know exactly what I mean. And, and before you know it, you're going down a fractal tunnel of skulls and um, 
you, you, you're thinking of death and, uh, and all the rest of it. Whereas if you're in like a, I've always described it like you need to set, set yourself up a crash. You know, assume you're going to be four years old for the day. Uh, yeah. You need to like playful things, literally like teddy bears. And, and it sounds stupid, I know, but if you take it, you'll <laughs> the right playlist. Music is a hundred times better on. Uh, uh, so anyway, what I was getting to was your. Do you mind talking about ayahuasca? Yeah, for sure. So, um, so do you want me to? Because I think this kind of ties in about how I overcame my addiction. So should I just say that whole yeah, thing? Yeah, that's. I was, uh, I was my rain. My rainforest question was too subtle, but um, I forgot <laughs> how much time you spend in the rainforest. <laughs> I'm a pixie, so I'm gonna spend time in the forest. Uh, so Should basically, yeah, so um, I grew up in South Africa and I moved to the UK when I was 20. And when I got there, I was very much living in the city, working a job I hated. It was usually office London. work. London, yeah, yeah. It was usually work that I hated that didn't inspire me at all. Um, yeah. But I didn't really know about there being any other way out of that. Like I was kind of conditioned that you ha you had to make money and that yep. I hadn't studied, I didn't finish college. Um, I never really knew what I wanted to study. So I just kind of left it and went traveling. And um, so I always did office jobs that paid well. And that's actually where I met you at TFL. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, um... Oh, that's a lifetime ago. <laughs> you, you were like one of two pleasant surprises about that job. Um, yeah. Yeah, so well, yeah. well done for that. Um, <laughs> So ayahuasca, how did it free you? So yes, yeah, so I worked. I worked. I was working jobs I hated, and then on the weekends I was just getting completely smashed, like drinking, taking drugs, like partying. Like that's literally all I did throughout my twenties. And at the age of twenty-eight, um, I actually got fired from TFL, um, where I was so distraught because I'd been there for six years. It was actually the best thing that ever happened to me. And yep. When that happened to me, I kind of was like, I think like one of the keys to beating addictions is to stop the sort of monotonous, vicious cycle, like being in a rut. If you just keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, it's kind of yeah. hard to stop that pattern. But if you actually stop something that's a big part of your life, which was for me was working at TFL, I started to transport reflect on my life. Huh? Trans transport for London, just for people transport who don't know. Yeah, yeah, transport for London. So I started to reflect on my life and think, what the hell am I doing? Like, I'm 28 years old, I'm working a job I hate, like, what, what am I doing? So I just started thinking about my life yeah. and thinking about what I wanted to do. And I sat at home for a little while until I got a new job. And I was researching quite a bit. And uh, my mom's always been a very spiritual person. And she was always into meditation and things like that. And um, so I started doing a lot of research and I think that one thing that really uh, made a big difference was the 9-11 had happened and uh, my ex-boyfriend showed me a conspiracy theory uh, sort of documentary about it being an inside job and all that kind of stuff and and in the beginning I was like oh the government would never do that no ways no ways and then when I saw the documentary my eyes right. were just like oh my god it was like a veil had been lifted off my my head and I started to really like wake up from the illusion and I was like wow okay so I'm living in a lie this whole world is a lie like I want to do something that's of meaning for myself so I've always cared about the planet it's something I've always cared as a little girl I'd go past the factories and I'd freak out with all the smoke coming out of the factories so I thought okay let me do something good for the planet so I started donating to Greenpeace while I was donating to Greenpeace uh they actually called me and they were like do you want to up your donation and I was like well I want to do more than that can I get I get involved and they're like, yeah, join yeah. a volunteer group. So I joined a volunteer group, and that was really, really awesome. I, I had a lot of musician friends. I used to put, like, Greenpeace gigs on where I'd get all my musician friends to play for free, and then all the money we raised would go to Greenpeace, and I'd raise awareness about the Arctic or the rainforest. And so I started to get more well, purpose thank, in thank my life. That, because it was, it was some of those events that, that, I, that put me in touch with Greenpeace. So thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, so I started to get more purpose and more fulfillment in my life. And, and I started to feel like I was doing something that was contributing to make the world a better place, which really started right. to like make my spirits higher. And I, was, I started to feel like I no longer wanted to escape my reality. 
um, because I actually was doing something that had, you know, had meaning and that was contributing. It was being in service to the planet and to the humanity. And so because of that, my whole consciousness started shifting. And, and so I started, I became vegan. I stopped eating all animal products. Because uh, I was just doing all this research and then I started meditating and I quite happily and quite easily gave up alcohol and gave up taking drugs. But the only thing that I couldn't quit was weed. Smoking weed was a really hard one for me because with the alcohol and the, the drugs was more of a social, a social lubricant. The weed was an everyday addiction. Yeah. That, and it's, I, I feel like weed it's, is more Especially of, the salt. Just to, just to clarify, there's a, lot of, yeah. there's a lot of misconceptions yeah. about everything on the planet, but weed being one of them, compare it to alcohol, there's like whiskey and there's uh, like a small glass of red wine, you know, and that's a big difference. And it's the same with weed. And just, just um, you could probably guess just from the way Tess isn't um, schizophrenic, that it was very mild weed. I sometimes yeah. saw firsthand these addictions unfold and it was, it was terrible to behold, but um, you've... <laughs> You've atoned, and um, please, <laughs> please carry no, on. No, that's, that's a really good point because I found that it, it was my own friends, actually. If you have a sort of uh, uh, a dormant psycho sort of um, illness, like an illness, mm -hmm. a mental illness that's dormant, uh, if, you, if you smoke the chemical weed that's grown in England, which is called skunk, you know, it's, and it's grown indoors hydroponically. It doesn't have the soil or the sun. And it's a lot of chemicals are put into this weed to make it heavier and all sorts of things. And it can actually um, be a catalyst to trigger any sort of mental illness that you have within you. But I always yes. smoke the, uh, we called it Thai weed, which was like the more like the bush weed. I used to get imported from another country. It had a, it had a lot of seeds. It was brown in color, not green. Uh, so it was yeah. way more natural, and I always preferred the higher fat because I found when when I smoked skunk, it would kind of be like you know the drooling on the couch, like can't move, kind of high. And I've always hated yeah. that. Horrible. Yeah. Yeah. So why did why did, why was smoking weed every day becoming problematic, even though it's so mild? Because it was still something. Because at this stage, I wanted to. I've just started becoming a really spiritual person, and. I wanted to be completely self-fulfilled and not reliant on anything. And I still needed the weed. Like if I was to run out of weed, I would start freaking out like, oh, I can't run out. I need to get some more before I run out. And, and I didn't want to have that addiction hanging over my head. I didn't want to have something that controlled me. And so I had a real strong desire to quit, but I, I didn't know how to. And also at that point, all my friends were taking drugs and drinking alcohol. And the only way for me to party with them and to sort of not – get all annoyed yeah. and not have a good time was people, I just people think, oh, Tess, Tess has got a bit of a chip on her shoulder now she thinks she's better than I just staying sober you yeah can that sort of stuff. I did I got that a lot of my friends were telling me I was boring and they were mm -hmm. not some of my friends were supportive and some of them weren't some of them were just like I think that I triggered them because they could they they yeah. couldn't stop themselves and so the fact that I could so easily really triggered them and yeah they started to to, we started to sort of distance each, myself from them and I actually started to look for more conscious events in England which were sober events and I started going to these kind of events to meet more like-minded people that, yeah. that I could relate to and you know when you go out on a sober level when you make a connection with someone it's way more authentic whereas when you get drunk and you make friends with someone like I made yeah. so many friends drunk and we never ever maintained that friendship. Like you're just like, yeah, totally call you tomorrow. And then you just never call that person ever again. But I found when I was sober and I made these connections, I actually did follow through and they were more genuine and authentic. And I was able to remember everything that I said. I was completely copious mentis and coherent and it was just so much better. And the no hangovers were really awesome. But it was just the weed. So, just, the weed were these, were these all these real all these realizations? Did you have them before you took ayahuasca in the, in the rainforest, the proper dose with the shaman and all that, or after? Yeah, uh, before, before I was having it. Okay, before. Yeah. So could um, you describe the actual experience in the rainforest of, of taking yeah. the ayahuasca? Well, I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't actually in the rainforest. It was, I did it in Norfolk. <laughs> so you spend the rest of your life in the rainforest and you do ayahuasca in Norfolk? 
Just so you know, <laughs> not from England. Norfolk's a kind of there's a there's a joke about it. Um, oh, there was a lot of flooding in Norfolk last year, but the locals are delighted because they get to use their webbed feet and hands. <laughs> yeah, a bit cruel. Um, say untrue, yeah, but it's that it's yeah. it's kind of like it's it's tragic rural is how I is how I describe it. Anyway, yeah, so very, very countryside for sure. Very conservative, very countryside. Um, but so, just, so basically, take, what? go go go. Okay. Let's take so, you yeah. You're feeling anxious, no doubt. So basically, so I really wanted I really wanted to quit the weed, but I found it really really hard to do so. And so I was looking up ayahuasca retreats, and I've always known about right. ayahuasca because. I used to go to Brazil many times and they drink it there. All my cousins have drunk it. Like even my 10 year old cousin drank ayahuasca like in Brazil, but I never felt like it was the right time for me. So when I was going, well, I was really young. I was like, you know, 14 and I just like, I wasn't, I didn't resonate. It wasn't the right time for me to do it. Well, in so, the island, Alex Huxley's book about humanity going right, they give all the all the kids about like eleven or twelve with incense in a temple with a ritual where a psychedelic um, therapy session. Yeah. Um, so in the ideal world, it, that happens to every kid at ten, but I'm I'm not sure it's uh, they'll be on the curriculum anytime soon. Anyway, carry on, please. About. <laughs> but yeah, I, just, I do like that idea. I think it would be super healing, and I've heard that they've been giving it to. Uh, prisoners in prisoner like in in jail they'd be giving them ayahuasca and they've been having complete you know spiritual breakthroughs and there's actually a documentary wow. out which which you can find on netflix i can't remember what it's called but it's two military guys that are from suffer from ptsd from the war and their whole lives are completely messed up like they can't even talk to their families like they're having freak out they're seeing bomb explosions in their living room and um they can't love their wives and their children and so they actually volunteer to go and drink ayahuasca and it completely changes their life it's a really really beautiful heartfelt documentary i'm sure if you like google the keywords you'd find it so so yes i wanted to really drink it so i was looking up different places and because it's illegal in england i was looking up to do it maybe in spain or somewhere else where it's not legal where it's not illegal um but and then a really close friend of mine who i'd met, I'd met at a con- one of the conscious events she told me that she knew of a couple who had lived in the Amazon with the shamans and have actually learned how to brew the ayahuasca and that they were amazing. And I thought, well, what a great way to, to do it, you know, in England. And, um, you know, so I thought it was a, a more gentler way of doing it than going out into the Amazon for the first time. Cause going out in the Amazon, they basically, you drink it in the dark, in the forest and you're on your own. But here it was kind of a more gentler way of doing it. Like they had like a team of helpers. So, when you puke, they hold your ha- hair. When you crying, they give you a hug. So it was like a way more gentle way of doing it. And um, you get there. So for the first month before I drank it, they said to me that I had to set an intention. So my intention was I wanted to quit smoking weed. But also at that time, I just started fundraising for Greenpeace, which is one of the hardest jobs in the whole entire world to fundraise yeah, I I on yeah. the streets of London. You know? Yeah, it was really hard. I really cared so much about the planet, but um, when I was getting rejected, like time after time after time, it was really breaking me down. And I was starting to get despondent and being like, no one cares about the planet. And I used to come in crying and no one thought I would last. And I really wanted to do good at this job because it was the first time I was getting paid to do something that meant something to me. So that was my second yeah. intention. I was like, I want to be good at my green peace job. <laughs> so for the, for the whole That's month before that, Let's pause you one sec. There's something rattling quite a lot. Have you got have you got some huge bracelet on that's hitting a table? There's something rattling as you as you sort of gesticulate. Uh, I do, Does, have do you know a, what I mean? Oh Jesus! Bracelet. It could be those. <laughs> could you please do you mind to like taking them off or covering them up so they don't because they're making a lot of noise on the, okay, <laughs> on the table. Okay. <laughs> I'll just gesticulate with this hand. That was okay. even more bracelets than I suspected. Sorry, carry on. No, no, uh, no, ayahuasca, cool. Norfolk. Yeah. So. So, yeah, so basically they said I'm going to set my intentions, which I did. And then they told me to stop smoking weed for a whole month before I do the ayahuasca ceremony, which was super difficult for me, man. Like, I think I did actually eat maybe once and have like a couple of puffs, but it was super hard and I did stick to it. Didn't smoke for a whole month. And so the week before you have to completely uh, have a vegan diet, no sex, no alcohol, no like nothing. Like it's quite strict. 
And then for a full day before, you have to fast, no eating. So mm-hmm. I did all the rules. I followed everything. And we go off to Norfolk. And um, we did the ceremony. And it was about 20 of us all together. And it was really beautiful set up. They had like a lot of crystals and they played really beautiful music and everyone was dressed all in white and they staged us and we all spoke of our intentions before. And yeah, they call us up one by one to come up and drink a cup. So I drink a cup and it tastes horrible, by the way, like really, really bitter. I drank my first cup, went to sit down and everyone's got their own little place where you sit and you've got like pillows and blankets and your water and whatever you need. And you're supposed to, it's supposed to be sort of, a, an inner journey so you're not supposed to sit and talk to other people you're on your own and you're processing you're reflecting so right. they call up for the second cup I drink the second cup and everyone around me is puking and crying and screaming and going really crazy and I don't feel anything I'm just like okay nothing's happening so the first night nothing happened second day we, it, was a, it was a weekend thing, Friday night and Saturday night were the two ceremonies. Saturday night comes, we have a share on the Saturday day, so everyone shares their experiences. And I was just like, yeah, nothing happened. But, you know, I'm hoping the second time something will happen. Second time comes, we all drink our cups. I drink a third cup this time to really make sure something happens. And that's not common. No one really drinks three cups. I was probably like, me, it was just like me and one other person that drank three cups. And still, I didn't feel anything. I don't feel nothing. Like it was That's insane. So strange. I know. Strange. And everyone else around me felt it because they were all crying, puking, screaming, doing all the things. And so the shaman comes up to me and she's like, How great. You? Yeah, yeah. It's lovely. I mean they had nice music, didgeridoo and drums and oh, stuff like that. <laughs> what um, so she comes up to me and she's like, What can how are you feeling? So I was just like, I don't feel anything. So she said to me, Well, Basically, did you did you stick to the protocol? Did you give up the weed a month before? And I was like, yeah, no, I really did. It was very difficult, but I did do it. And she was like, okay, well, what about your relationship with weed before then? So I told her, no, I've been smoking weed almost every day for 10 years. So she said to me that basically the reason why I wasn't feeling the ayahuasca was because my receptors were blocked. And she said that that's basically... Your receptors are like your your connection to the universe, your connection to consciousness, your connection to... To having these this psychedelic experience, like they were just the, 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 the electrical the electrical inputs and circuitry that make up the brain. Exactly. For, for, in, in a more sort of for people out there who who've just gone, oh, you know, it's not science. Um, same thing. Yeah, so I know yeah. what you mean. Yeah, no, you. Yeah, that's exactly what you mean. So the my neurotransmitters and all of that kind of stuff had been severely blocked because of me relying on on weed for so long and. She said that basically, um, because at that point in my life, reaching spiritual enlightenment was the most important thing to me. And she said that if I'm going to carry on smoking weed, it's going to be like having a crutch on, on my path to spiritual enlightenment. She said it um, it numbs you, which it totally does. Um, when I would have uh, bad breakups with my boyfriends and I'd be crying, crying, crying and I'd smoke a joint and I'd be like, oh, what was I crying about? It's not even a big deal at all. And so yeah. basically it numbs your emotions and by numbing your emotions, you're not able to feel the pain. You're not able to grow from the situation. And so she said that you're never going to really grow and you're never going to be your, uh, your full, you know, enlightened self if you're going to carry on smoking like you do. And it was in a very right. habitual way and in a form of escapism. And so I was like, wow, when she said that to me, it really hit home. And I was like, wow, that really makes sense. You know, so next How- day we, yeah. How do you explain Snoop Dogg? What do you mean? <laughs> Snoop well, Dogg. <laughs> he's been he's been God knows how much he smokes in private, but whenever you see a photo of him in the last like twenty five years, yeah. his eyes are like two rubies, so they're so red and he's got a massive blunt in his mouth. Yeah. And he's and he's incre- incredibly I'd say a lovely uh, enlightened, sweet, warm person who ends all his beefs with love and do you, do, you, like, do you think it works for some people? Like, or do you, think, do you think Snoop Dogg would be better off without? Yes, definitely. He'd be better, better off without. You can, you can preach about love, but that doesn't mean that you're living a spiritual life. Like, I, don't, I honestly don't, 
I honestly think that if you want to reach your fullest potential, you can't you can't be addicted to anything. And he's smoking it every single day. And for me, if you're doing something every single day, it's because you're not happy with your world, the, the way your world is without it. So, Do you think you can have healthy healthy addictions? To water. To to um water to exercise to meditation to yoga yeah, to yeah, sure. to to yeah. vegan to the because veganism is a, a sort of philosophy as well as a, eat, a le- eating lifestyle are yeah, they, are they, those are they, more lifestyle choices and addictions i'd say okay but like say yoga say meditation say i'm just playing devil's advocate yeah 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 no, I, I do. like i'd find it a real struggle to give up meditation a real struggle and one would think that if i was going for true self-fulfilled freedom doesn't depend on any, any conditions enlightenment i wouldn't need to do meditation or yoga or running or anything i just need sunlight and water and a bit i think meditation is a very key part to enlightenment because that's how you get rid of your external thoughts and how you that's maintaining an inner peace. I think it's a very a very important key to that. If you overdo it, if you're like spending like six or eight hours every day doing it, then yeah, it can maybe become harmful or an addiction in the sense that you aren't able to deal with your natural environment and you always just want to like forget about everything and be in a form of meditation. Then yeah, I'd say it can be an addiction. Yeah. If you overdo anything, like if you're doing too right. much of it, then yeah. I think everything there's all kinds of... Sorry? Everything in moderation. Apart from excess. Um, the road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom, they say. And uh, as I'm sure you'd agree. Um, Shall I finish my story? <laughs> I'm nearly at the end of it. No, we're going to end the video right now. Yes, please go <laughs> ahead. And stop, stop it with those bracelets. Sorry. So then, basically... <laughs> So basically, um, the next day we left the ayahuasca ceremony and it's the strangest thing ever, but I actually gave up smoking weed the next day, even though I didn't journey on the, the ayahuasca. Next day. Yeah. So tell I, it, one sec. So you, you had the ayahuasca three times. It didn't seem to do anything. No. At first. Well, see, the thing is with ayahuasca, because she's a spirit and because I set an intention and I communed with her and I showed her gratitude and love she did work through me she always works through you but it always w- it always will be in different ways and always be in the way that is meant to serve you for your highest good and at that time I wasn't meant to journey because knowing that I couldn't journey because of the weed was what made me stop knowing that my receptors were blocked knowing that my enlightenment would be hindered was what made me stop surely so, there were other people there who smoked a lot of weed um two months before that do you know what i mean they quit a month before and, and they and they do you think you just smoked so much weed that ayahuasca didn't hit you in the traditional way a normal it's amount not, or i mean it, it's it definitely depends on the person because i have a cousin in brazil who smokes a lot of weed and he journeys on ayahuasca so right. I, I think it definitely depends on the person but i think in order for it to work on me, I had to have that experience. And so that's why ayahuasca is so, so beautiful because she's a really intelligent being, a really intelligent plant being that she knows what's best for you and sh- you'll always get what you're meant to get like through through drinking or, or working with her. And That's another so, way that hold, occurred to me, it's like uh, the Matrix, you know how people often talk about the psychedelics in the Matrix. Um, yeah. For good reason, I'd say. And there's the oracle, isn't there? Yeah. Um, it always tells you what you need to hear, uh, yeah. even if it's um, even if it's a lie. It, 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 it's what you need to hear, but not delivered in a way you'd expect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Right. Can okay. Yeah. So I basically the next day quit smoking weed. Um, it wasn't something that like I'd say I quit smoking every day, but I would still go to the odd festival and have a few puffs here and there, but I stopped buying it, which was the main thing. So I was smoking half an ounce every month. So I com- I'm, since then, I've not bought weed ever since. And it's been, that was six years ago. You just steal it. <laughs> Comes to me. 
No, I'm joking. It's it's actually really strange now. My my relationship with it's completely changed, and now when I smoke it, I actually don't like getting high anymore. I feel like it makes my cl- my brain real foggy. Um, it makes me really slow. I actually just don't like the high. I really love being focused and clear minded and sharp, and having a sharp wood about me. Um, but the the other miraculous thing that happened was I became the second best fundraiser in the whole country for Greenpeace. Well, considering your motivation and your hustle, I'm not surprised. Who was the who was number one? Who beat you to it? Uh, it a, I think it was a girl named uh, Lydia. Lydia, actually, yeah. She was older than me. Okay. She was really good. But yeah, Sounds I mean, like from going from bitch. someone that was nearly about to get fired, who couldn't get, I could hardly get like one or two sign-ups a week, to getting yeah. the second most in the whole country, not even just in London, in the whole country. So it really... No, I, 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 both my intentions got realized through the ayahuasca. I'm laughing because um, I know and you know why you got sacked from TFL and our listeners don't. And it was so ridiculous. And you <laughs> did so well out of that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there isn't any card. There isn't any card. There isn't any card. Well, you, didn't do, you, didn't do anything, you didn't do anything wrong. But a lot, <laughs> a lot came to you from, from a, a very, very, very slight... Um, Lapse in morality, let's say. So, <laughs> what? <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> what have you seen? Tests. People have got a, a some idea of, of what you're like now. What what advice would you give to? No, sorry. What would be the what have you observed to be the biggest help in people's mental health? Because I don't think ayahuasca and LSD and mushrooms are for everyone. You know. Um, um... So apart from. Apart from the psychedelic interventions, yeah, which we've covered quite a bit, what else? Finding your purpose is solely the best thing that one can do. Finding something that gives you meaning, something that you are proud of doing, something that lights your fire, lights your passion inside you. If you do something that you love every day, then you won't, you won't want to escape your reality because you're so happy because you're doing what you love. Just honestly, for me, working for Greenpeace, that was the single most important thing I ever did because I was contributing to making the world a better place. I had purpose, I had meaning, I was happy. I met like-minded people. It was sing- like really, really the most tra- transformative thing of my life, for sure. And I think anyone that has addiction problems, you know, it doesn't have to be a job that you change, but if you like anything that you like, there's a website called Meetup. If you like swing dancing, or if you like going for hikes in nature, you can go on this website and there's different topics and you can go to meetups every week and find people that are doing it with you. And that for me literally changed my life. And for me being in service, like actually doing something that's actually making the world a better place. Like, so if you could volunteer, volunteering for any sort of thing, like volunteering for the blind or the homeless, like for that, that for me was a big game changer because you feel like you're actually a useful person and you're actually doing good in the world and that makes you feel good being kind what would you what would you say to people who who have very strong urges but they're very but they're they're dark urges like they, they want to hurt people or they want to they're 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 inappropriately attracted to children or, or they or they when they get angry they hit their dog and they regret it afterwards what, what would you say to people who like that well, then they I mean, they definitely need therapy for sure because the reason why they're acting that way is because of their childhood traumas. Most people that are act in a certain violent way is because they never had love growing up. And so in order to, yeah. to, to go through that, that psychotherapy with someone, I think it's really, really important to uncover those traumas because you have to feel those traumas like, there's, a, there's a, a guy that I follow called Matt Kahn, which I really recommend to anyone who's on a spiritual path. And he says you've got to feel it to heal it. You've got to break down to break through. So you've got to feel the pain that you went through instead of blocking the pain and just like sweeping it under the carpet, which a lot of people do. They don't face their shadows. Uh, in order to, to be a truly happy person is you need to face your shadows. And I did that last year. I faced my unworthiness, my attachments, my self-doubt my comparison wounds, all those kind of things. I really, really felt it and felt the pain of it. 
so that I could heal it. You have to go through it. And, you, and so those people have to speak about the traumas that they went through with someone. I think that would be really helpful. I think you're right. I also like the term comparison wounds. Can you, can you unpack that? Yeah. So I had a bigger comparison wound. I, I, have, I, have, I have a belief that every single person you meet, you, you, there'll be a lesson that you'll learn from that person and there'll be a, a, a reason for growth. And I feel like everybody that you meet is playing a role to triggering you what needs to be healed. And so one of my best friends, uh, she was a really, really beautiful girl. She got a lot of attention. She was sort of better at things that I like, like she's better at guitar. She's got, she just like everything that I enjoyed, she was better at it than me. And so it was really difficult for me to, and she was my best friend. So we'd go out all the time and she'd get all the male attention and she would get all this, all this stuff would happen to me. And I kept getting triggered and triggered and triggered. And eventually what I realized was that a lot of the things that I started to, I kind of put her on a pedestal and I realized that she, I'd made this whole idea up of how she was this perfect person. And when she came away, yeah. um, she actually came to California and we spent three months together every single day. I started, she started to unravel her insecurities and her, her sort of um, bad qualities, they're not bad, but the qualities that were not deemed that I didn't know about. And I started to see her for who she really was. And I started to realize that yeah. there was a lot of qualities that I had that she didn't have and a lot of qualities that she had that I didn't have. And I started to realize that you know, when instead of a guy liking her because of me, it's not because she's better than me. It's because those guys aren't meant to be with me. You know, different, like, if a guy notices her rather than me, then that's the kind of guy that I don't want to be with anyway. So sometimes it just change my perception on things. Like, like you know, different strokes for different folks. Like, it's not it's not something personal. It's just something that, it's a chemistry thing. It's a, and it's, it's just, it's because I started working on myself and realizing and loving myself and realizing all the things that I was good at and and you know once you show more love to yourself for those things then the comparison wound will 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 fall away more and more and more and and I realized a lot of the things that she really battled with the things that I didn't battle with at all and those things started to make me love myself more and so right yeah you, um please take the bracelets off very beautiful point but I had a, I had a, I had a distinct like Birdman, it had a distinct uh, soundtrack all the way through it of a percussive, percussive nature. <laughs> right, um, I'm sitting on my hand now. Do you think social media fuels um, comparison wounds to a oh, to a shocking degree? Because that, because I do like um, like you were saying about your friend. Normally, you might just see her at her best when she, you know, you've you've met her after the two hours of makeup and and dress and all that, or, or you've seen a picture on on Facebook, or she's. You see her at her best at work. People don't post pictures of themselves whilst they're having diarrhea, you know, <laughs> sloppy, <laughs> semolina gravy shits, or all when they're crying at their duvet, or when their parents have just made them feel, you know, that big. Or it, it's um, it's so so easy, especially now, and especially now in a pandemic when everyone's isolated, to get to build up, like you say, these false um, idealized images of people. It's the one problem with dating sites. Um, you, you imagine what they're like, and it's different to what you're like, and they're, and, they're, and they're desperate to maintain that projection, or whilst all the time maintaining a deep, deep insecurity, which a lot of us don't actually see because we're so insecure ourselves, we only see the, the, um, the image that they're putting forward, or that we're putting forward. We're all doing it to one degree or another. Oh, for sure. But I think that's why this this pandemic is actually a really, really amazing opportunity for people to face their shadows because for they're not so busy. It's not go, 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 do, do, do. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm here. I'm stuck here with my thoughts. I have nothing else to do but think about my life and have self-reflection. And so I think- What do you mean by, what do you mean by shadows? And I, one, one thing I'd say, I think people need to change their relationship to thoughts rather than think, you can't think, like Albert Einstein said, a problem solved, a problem created on one level of consciousness can't be solved on that same level. Yeah. It has to be solved slightly higher. So, like, so meditation, yoga, stuff like that. Um, yeah. Carry and on, please. What really helped me with my, with, so when I say shadow, I mean like your, your traumas or like, so my, my shadow would have been like the comparison wound, my attachment wound, all those kind of things. Um, 
for me, what I think really helped, like you said, changing your perception of it was I would look at my shadows as an opportunity for growth and for something that's actually going to help me evolve rather than something that's bad. Like, so I think that yeah. really helped me because a lot of people are like, oh, no, that's a bad thing. That's a bad thing. And they kind of just want to like shove it away. But if you look at it like, oh, my gosh, that's actually an opportunity for me to be a better person or an opportunity for me to grow, then you have less judgment on the shadow and you have less judgment for the person that's causing that in you because you realize that that person is playing that role in order for you to grow. So I think changing your perception is very, very helpful. And yeah, like that guy, Matt Connor told you, he says, everything is here to help you. Everything that happens to you is there just to help your evolution, help you to grow. Um, I wouldn't say that's someone at the gates of Auschwitz, but do you believe that? Do you believe in free will? Yeah, of course. But I, I don't personally, and I'm increasingly don't. But it sounds like it sounds like it sounds like you're getting at think that things are pre preordained, and we're here for you know. Do you know I mean, you meet people for a reason implies yeah. that some it implies that. It's not that the that there isn't much free will. If you, if, if well, the plan all along was for you to meet so and so. Yeah. So what I think is it's 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 a dance between destiny and free will, and I believe you'll always meet who you're meant to meet, and you'll always right. that person will bring out in you what's what's meant to bring out. But the free will is how you react to the situation, how you react to that person. You can either take the path where you're a good person and you do the good thing, or you can do the wrong thing and go down the wrong path. That's the test you put on yourself. So I believe that you choose, and there is destiny. You choose who you're going to meet. You choose the lessons that you're going to have. But you're free. You forget about these things that you've preordained, the destined things. You forget about it when you incarnate on this planet. And then when these instances happen and you meet these people, you've forgotten that you've chosen it. So you you react to that person out of free will, and you can either like completely, you know, love the person that come into your life or you can hate them and shut them out that's your free will and that's the test that you put on yourself okay beautifully put but don't don't you think the force behind that implies a a, a lack of free will um like say say if you meet someone and you like the look of them or not that's not really up to you it's like the next thought that pops into your head and you'll know this from intense introspection you don't choose um and you don't you don't choose even, even the thought I'm going to turn my life around. Just pops, just comes to you. It comes to you. You're not of your own volition and freedom, conjuring it up and pushing it forward into into the potential of of the of reality. Do you know what I mean? It's um, it's, it depends on your. If if you spent your upbringing locked up in a dungeon, um, the be you know. <laughs> As opposed, as opposed to having a sort of nice middle class. Um, uh, uh, I'm not. This not you. The general you. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, you're going to be prompted to do very, 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 very different things. And it seems like if you were born in a dungeon, um, and if there was true free will, then God or the world or ayahuasca's plan for the, the some of the gates, the gates of Auschwitz or someone born in a sex dungeon, not to get too, too dark, but that it, it seems like that was their destiny if, if what you're oh, yeah. saying is... is Well, yeah, I believe anyone, and this is a very controversial topic, but I do believe that anyone that was, like you said, born as a sex slave or born into a cult family or whatever, I I think that they chose to have that experience. When when I'm saying that things destiny, your higher self, which I think is your soul that is in the spirit world, because I believe that not all, when you incarnate, only some of your energy comes into this incarnation. The rest of you is in the spirit world. And we call it the higher self. Because the higher self remembers all your past lives, remembers all, like knows all the lessons that you've chosen, everything. So I believe when you've come here and you've, and say you've born into this, this really dark upbringing, you chose those people to be your parents. You chose to have that dark upbringing. Because maybe in a past life, you were you were the person that did wrong to others, so you want to feel what it's like to be wrong done by. So if you chose, if one lifetime you raped someone, you might be cho- you choose in the next life what it feels like to be raped, so that your soul can evolve from from that experience, so you can feel both sides of the of the story. So I believe anyone that's suffering, there's an actually right. really beautiful quote. It says, "The more difficult a person's life, the more beautiful the soul that wrote it." I I agree. Um, 
there's quite a philosophical proposition you're putting forward um and it's, it's quite compelling and it, it sounds quite it sounds quite good but, but what about say so i agree so I've, I've watched a few testimonies with holocaust survivors and you're right they they appreciate every second of, of just like a of of peace and someone being and just niceness and not being in fucking Auschwitz, right so yeah. i know what you mean about people like that and they're amazing people for that because of the intense suffering Victor mm -hmm. Frankel's Man's Search for Meaning is a good book on that, very, very short. He's a brilliant psychoanalyst who ended up in four concentration camps and survived them all. Wow. Um, he said, like you said, you couldn't control what they did to you, but you could control how you reacted. Yeah. Um, but what about the people who, and I'm not, this is an unfair question, but I think you'll take it well. What about all the children who were shipped off to Auschwitz and never left Auschwitz? They chose to do that. Mm. in a past life before they were in before they incarnated on the earth they chose to go through that experience i believe every single person chose have all chosen the experiences that they go through and the test is how you react to the experience that you've put on yourself okay so i imagine what you just said and maybe what someone i just said will get some some people are very emotionally attached to ideas and they get emotionally know. hijacked and what and what you've just done is 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 got the hackles up on some people and they're like, right, I'm going to leave a comment, but um, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's very I'm controversial. Not I'm not industrious enough or brave enough to say to make a video of my own talking about stuff. I'm just going to leave a nasty comment underneath the video saying this bitch doesn't know what she's talking about or something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's fine. I'm totally open to all conversations and and I also think that um, you know I'm planting the seed subconsciously and. You know, it has been proven there are so many people and cases of kids remembering their past lives, of adults remembering their past lives. Like they, there was this one kid that was able to describe exactly what the village looked like in a place that this kid has never been to. And there's just yeah. too many cases like this that have been proven that reincarnation does exist. And I will say, by far the best um, psychotherapist I saw had studied parapsychology for 20 years. And for anyone completely dismissing what Tess is saying, thinking, oh, what does she know? Sam Harris, who I'm sure a lot of you know if you are of an atheist, skeptic, scientific mindset, who's a very distinguished neuroscientist um, and a very famous atheist and has sat on years of silent meditation retreats, says that there's, there's um, spooky data on past lives. So don't completely dismiss it. I, I don't know for sure. You sound quite sure. I do. I'm quite sure. Yeah. Okay. I'm quite unwavering in my beliefs. I, is that is that optimal? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it it helps me to be the best person that I can be. I believe that we're all one. We're all part of the same consciousness. And by having that realization, I treat every single person as if I was is how I want to be treated because that is me. That is just a reflection of me. So I think these beliefs that I have only can only benefit humanity and myself because it's one that believing that we're all equal and that we should all be treated with kindness and compassion and that everything happens for a reason and it's all for my own spiritual growth. And I even believe that the darkness is playing a role. People that do really yeah. bad things. The main role. Yeah. The main role. Yeah. And like, you know, we need the darkness to experience the light and it's all part of the evolution of, of, of all of us is to experience that. And so, you know, you could actually get someone who's a really, really dark person who might actually be a really amazing angel who's come here, chosen to play a really bad role in order to uplift people or to show people that that's not the way that they should act, that that's the wrong like way. Like an age on, age on provocateur sent down from... Um, or People always think of heaven as above us, but the world the world is is round. I know it's controversial to say, but and is and is suspended in space. So it, he, heaven could be below you as well. Oh, humans yeah. have humans have a very 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 deep instinct to escape upwards when you've been chased. You go up the tree or you run up the building. You don't yeah, go into basements or bur start burrowing underground. Do you know what I mean? So people 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 who think heaven is is that way think again. <laughs> could be that way. It could be right here. It could just be within you. Well, that's what Jesus said. The kingdom of yeah. heaven is within. So, yeah. um, 
<laughs> Tess, it's been great talking to you. Um, we're just about to hit the hour mark. Um, would you come back on my channel another time and talk about some more mental health related interesting stuff? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'll be well up for it. It's been awesome talking to you. Cool. I'm not going to pay you. <laughs> Maya, it's a service for me to do this, Rob. That's payment in itself. Okay. What have you been stroking this whole time, by the way? Was it your own foot or have you got a pet there? I heard some barking. Uh, we, there is a dog around you somewhere, yeah, sure. You make, you make it sound like he's a squatter who occasionally pops in, and, but you don't know if he lives uh, there. I'm, you have I'm, a dog? I'm at a friend's house, so it's not. This is, I live in a van. I've been living in a van for three years. Most liberating thing I ever did. And you're in the woods in California, is that right? That's right, yeah. Oh, one thing I meant to bring up with you, I don't want to... Actually, you've quit weed, so you, you won't care, but there's a, there was a, guy, a park ranger who you think of, like, picnic baskets, but in reality, they, you know, they've had to up their game to guns and stuff, um, fighting the cartels, because I can't remember if it was 60% or 80%. It was definitely one of those two. I should have double-checked. Of the weed grown in California, Cali weed, meant to be the best weed ever, is grown by the cartels and is... Um, aided by a very, very, very toxic um, insect repellent. I believe it's an insect repellent. Um, did um, you know that? That's probably true, but since I've been here, I mean, there's about 10,000 farms in California, and all the ones that I've been to have all been local families, completely organic, and, yes, yeah, so I've not had that experience, but I can definitely believe that there's, yeah, I've, known, I've heard that there's cartels here for sure. Yeah, the, the interview, uh, last thing I'll say, and if people are inter, uh, interested on, on Joe Rogan's podcast, and if you type in Park Ranger Cartels, we, that'll come up, no doubt. Anyway, Tess, um, who's the best singer of all time? <laughs> who's the best singer of all time? Yeah. You, Rob. I wasn't looking for that, <laughs> but no, really. <laughs> uh, well, my favorite band is Muse, for sure. Okay, I, I've got to say, when, when they hit it, they really, like Citizen Arrays, that song is really, 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 really every, good. Every album they've ever made has been just top notch. Yeah, I don't know about that, but um, they've de they're definitely, they definitely push things forward, I think. Yeah. They lifted things in a way, um, which is hard to describe. Anyway, guys, please comment on, on this. If you're liking these interviews, please check out the ones I did with the managing director of the International School of Musicians. Pretty cool. Please check down the one with the nuclear, the guy who was offered the nuclear engineering degree. He could have, literally could have made the next hydrogen bomb, which is made of atom bombs, but it's turned that down. And wow. sued spirituality, essentially. Um, so I've got an interview with him. Please watch that. Obviously, you've just watched this if, you, if you're listening to this bit of this. Uh, so watch it again. And Tess, can you please sing some sort of compelling theme tune whilst I um, figure out how to stop this? It should only take three seconds, so just hum away, please. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I don't know why the wedding song came to me. 